Up next, a look at Bastille from Queen Games. Queen Games provided us with a review copy of this game. No other compensation was provided. Uh, Bastille was designed by Christopher Christoph Bear and features art by David Cockard. It was released at Essen 2018 by Queen Games. It plays three or four players, and that game takes uh, about an hour. For a look at what you get in the box, be sure to check out our Bastille unboxing video on YouTube. There'll be a link to that in our show notes. Now, I don't have the time here to go through each component in detail, and that's probably going to happen with anything, uh, any Euro game like this, right? There's a lot of bits. If you do want to see everything you get, it's on the YouTube video, or you can go over to the blog post. But what I have to say here is I was extremely impressed by the component quality uh, in Bastille here. Like Queen Games is known for making high quality games, and Bastille is no exception. This is some of the best designed and layout I've seen in a game uh, with clear, large iconography used throughout and just little touches like a color-coded board that matches a similarly color-coded rulebook. Well, from the game's description, it's the eve of the French Revolution and you are the leader of a revolutionary group trying to best position your faction to be ready for when the revolution inevitably begins. To do so, you need money, influence, revolutionary leaders, weapons to arm them, and more. The timing of this review is actually somewhat amusing as Bastille Day, to commemorate the storming of the Bastille, was July 14th. That was yesterday. We should have recorded this yesterday. <laughs> I know. But enough about messy reality. How about you give us an <laughs> overview of play in the game Bastille? All right, to start a game of Bastille, put the board out, put out four random characters, put out a stack of Versailles tiles on the Versailles spot, uh, flip one face up, put a number of weapons in the Bastille uh, based on the number of players, stack the mission cards, and then put out the bonus tiles, one for each round, and flip up the one for round one. Now, players are going to take their bits, and you are going to have a set of influence tiles, uh, the exact numbers of which are based on the number of players. A scoring tile, which is if you happen to lap the board, you get to put that out. Henchman cubes and eight coins. Uh, you get two meeples. One's going to go at the start of the scoring track, and another is going to go on a track that circles the Bastille, known as the Bastille track. You're going to draw the top card from the mission deck, which gives you an endgame scoring goal. Now, a game of Bastille is played over eight rounds. Each round is broken into three phases. Now, first, you're going to place those influence tiles out. Then the locations on the board are resolved in numeric order. And then there's this flag scoring phase. In addition to that, there are two scoring rounds. One happens at the end of round four, and another one happens at the end of the game. So basically, you've got 26 steps to complete the game if you include those scoring rounds from start yep. to finish. Sounds about right. I don't think I ever counted them or did the math. <laughs> uh, first thing you do is place your influence token. So in turn, you're going to choose one of your tokens and place it on one of the locations in Paris on the board. Uh, each of the locations has room for either two up to four influence tokens, depending on the spot. Most spots only hold two. Some of them hold up to four. Once a spot's taken, no one else can place in that spot. And you always have to make sure you play left to right. And the reason for that is that ties are broken based on who placed first. Uh, interestingly enough, players can play multiple place, multiple tokens to the same place if they are available. Now, once you've all placed your tokens, you're now going to go through starting at location one, going to location seven, and evaluate them. The way they're evaluated is the person who placed the highest number influence token there is the one that gets to activate the location, gets to do the thing followed by the player with the second highest influence and then third highest influence, fourth highest influence. Now, again, no, you could be first and second. So it could be the same player that has these spots or more often it's different. Again, ties are awarded to the player who went there first. So the person furthest to the left. So players are bidding for the right to take actions on the board with the player bidding the most, getting some form of additional advantage yep. uh, or first if, if in case of a tie. Yeah, or placed first, yeah. So if you play the same influence, you both have threes, the person who played the three first is going to get the bonus. Now, deciding what influence token to place where is a big part of Blastille. And also, not only where, but when. Making sure, like, looking at what everyone else has. So this is another game. This is a game where everything is open information. You're not hiding anything. There's no player screens. You always see exactly how much money everyone has, what characters they've hired, and how much influence they have. 
Now, I at first I was going to sit here and go through all of the seven locations, but you know what? That's going to take us another 20 minutes. So if you want a breakdown of every location, you're going to have to check out the blog because I don't want to spend too much time on it here. But basically, there are spots that get you more money, spots that let you improve your influence tokens, a spot to collect bonuses, like you can get extra points, move on the pastille track, get some torches. Torches are wild card weapons you want to collect and so on. There's the catacombs where this one's kind of neat because you place little cubes. They represent your henchmen going into the catacombs underneath Paris. And they may come out during the scoring round to get you bonuses. There's a spot to hire characters. So you're, you're building your revolutionary army and you place those in your tableau. Then there's the Bastille itself, which I mentioned earlier is a track. So you can go up on that track and you're going to get points during the scoring round based on how far you're up that track. And the Bastille also determines which order you get to grab weapons. So it's an important track to being up. The last place just lets you get mission cards, which are end game scoring. So it's really interesting because this is essentially in many ways a dry, boring Euro, except mm. they have managed to tie the theme in with this dry, boring Euro to take it to another level that you mm. don't normally expect from a lot of these cube pusher type games. No, I totally agree on this one. I uh, think again, if you get into the details, like you get the money, you go to the bank. Like the, the the locations are tied to what you get from them, and it just makes sense. So next is the final stage. I mentioned this before. It's called flag scoring. All this is is you look at your citizens. Whoever has the most French flags gets a bonus for having it, and then the person with the second most flag gets another bonus. Now, once you get to turn four, you're halfway through the game, right? Four out of eight rounds. You're going to do an interim scoring round. Now, players are going to get points for a number of things. Uh, the number of gems on the characters they've collected, having the most crowns on the characters they collected, how far they are around the Bastille track. And then that cool catacombs thing happens. So I do want to explain this because I think it's a neat thing. So what happens is you've got this bag where you've been putting in henchmen throughout the game. Well, during the scoring round, you pull out five cubes. And then when each cube's pulled out, the player gets some kind of reward. And there's like two different catacomb boards and you pick which reward it is. And depending on the level of the reward, you're either going to get to put the guy back in the catacomb, the, the henchman back in the catacomb, or you just take the reward and they're considered gone for the rest of the game. So there's a little bit of a push your luck element there. Then after you've done the catacomb phase, you do get to take weapons from the best deal. So again, the person who's in front is going to get two weapons. The next person is going to get two weapons. And the person who's in last only gets one weapon. So the catacombs aspect is another really interesting one because the catacombs of Paris have played such a huge role in mm. the city's history, including throughout the, uh, the storming of the Bastille and, and preparations to and the revolution itself. Uh, but they aren't straightforward. I mean, they yeah. are catacombs. They are a maze beneath the city. So the risk reward aspect even is very on point for the theme. Yeah. So we play four more rounds, right? We get to the eighth round and we do some end game scoring. It's very similar to the first game scoring. Uh, one of the things you do have to do here is rearrange your characters. So there are three types of characters. There's peasants, soldiers, and nobles. And you have to group them into groups. So all your peasants go together, all your soldiers go together, all your noblemen go together. And you also have monks. And monks are wild cards. They can join one of the other groups. This is all very important for the end game scoring cards. Then once you got your groups together, you need to arm your troops. So this is where you assign the weapons. And again, it's paired up. So the peasants need pitchforks. The soldiers need rifles and the nobles need rapiers. Now, torches count as wild cards. So torches are really valuable because you can give them to anyone. Then you're going to look at your tableau of characters and you're going to get a bunch of points for them. So you're going to get points for the gems on them, whoever has the most crowns, how far you've gone on that Bastille track. The, actually, every character card gives you a set number of points just for collecting them. Then you're going to go through your mission cards and see if you completed any of them. Again, those are endgame scoring cards. And then your coins that you have left. Now, again, you're going to explore the catacombs. The difference here is the rewards are slightly more limited because you're at the end of the game. So there's certain things that just aren't worth doing. And they're bigger rewards and you don't get your henchmen back. Now, the henchmen that are still left in the bag are actually still worth something. They are going to be worth one point each for every henchman that was still in the bag. So throwing your henchmen in the bag, even if they don't come out during two of the, the two scoring rounds, they still got you something. Finally, you look at your characters and you try to figure out if you left anyone unarmed because you don't want unarmed characters during a revolution. You are going to lose a number of points based on how many characters are unarmed at the end of the game. And this can be huge. If you have five or more characters unarmed, you're losing 20 points in a game that usually scores around 50 to 70. 
After this, the player with the most points win the game. Ties broken with the player with the most coins. Any future ties are a shared victory. All right, well, that's the technical aspects. Now let's talk about what works or doesn't work. All right, so when I brought Bastille home from Origins 2019, I honestly had no clue to expect. Uh, for anyone who wants the story, listen to previous episodes where I explained exactly where this game come from and why I brought it home. Now, one thing I did expect from this game is high quality presentation and components. This is a trademark of Queen Games. I don't, ex I expect Queen Games to look and look great. And this is a step above that in a way. This is one of the best designed games I've ever played in regards to not the mechanics, not that the mechanics are bad, but like the layout, the, the design of the board, the iconography, the colors used. Like this not only helps with information dissemination during play, easily being able to see stuff like from across the table, but it also helps when teaching the game to new players because everything's right there and easy to see. It's, it's always so fantastic when you've got a game that helps you help yourself with great design and visual cues to just mm -hmm. help things move along. Now, the other highlight for me with Bastille is the, the mechanics. The, it's, it's a mix of auction bidding with worker placement. Because placing an influence token on a spot is obviously worker placement. But by putting it there, you're actually bidding that amount of influence from your pool of influence to take that action. And then the next player, if they have a bigger influence token can outbid you and you may not get what you wanted. And I think that's really fascinating. That combination of bidding and worker placement, this whole influence system just works really well and opens up some very interesting decision points and timing the, the, the mix of where do I want to go? Do I want to go there first? Um, do I want to see what someone else bid before I go there? All of those are fascinating decisions to make. Yeah, and it has some real thematic linkage, again, with the factions in the French underground putting their own reputations on the line in order to draw greater support into their faction and, and you know, take the, take the lead when it came to storming the Bastille. Now, there are downfalls, of course. Uh, no game is perfect. And the one I have found, the biggest downfall when playing over multiple games of Bastille is the interaction of the character deck, how it's distributed. So it is a deck of different characters and they are split into A, B, C. And you shuffle the C deck and you put that in the bottom then the B deck and the A deck on top. And the order the characters come out in that is very important. And misunderstanding that can lead to players thinking they're going to be able to do something and score something and not be able to because a card's already out of the deck. So, uh, or totally misinterpreting the end game scoring where you're looking at the scoring thinking you need a series where instead you need a set as an example, I, without showing you the cards or getting into any details. Uh, these idiosyncrasies have caused the game to fall somewhat flat. Like I, I know when I've taught the game has had a horrible experience, but I've had a few, meh, it was okay feeling on the first game because of people not grasping how that character deck ties to the end game scoring deck, the mission deck. I see this, this immediately as I was reading through this reminded me of some of my experiences with Card Kingdoms of Valeria, which mm -hmm. is a game I love right up until that scoring round when it turns out that I have completely misread my end game scoring card and was collecting the wrong thing and have lost. Yeah. And that is literally what happened to Deanna the first time she played Best Deal. She aimed for a certain strategy and it collected a certain set of characters to score big points and got nothing because she misinterpreted how a card was read. Now, I will say, Queen tried, right? They tried to help. They gave you this reference card. But as a new player to this game, this thing's intimidating as heck. Like, this is a lot of information in one play that's just overwhelming. And I got to say, most people, players that aren't going to, they're not going to take the first play of a game seriously enough to deep dive this reference list to look up, oh, well, when does the seven peasant come out versus the three? Then when is that going to matter? And how many of each card is in the mission deck and things like that, right? And well, what this all means is that for players to really grok and enjoy Bastille, you need to play the game, in my opinion, at least twice. And I guess I say two tends to be enough. And the problem with that is today's board game culture is very much one and done. You play a game once, you have the experience, you move on to the next experience. And I have a feeling with Bastille, a lot of people are going to try this game. They're not going to deep dive it. And they're just going to be like, oh, eh, all right, let's move on. Yeah, I, I feel so 
strongly for game designers these days because they are being asked to design a game that is both sufficiently meaty and deep that you can get your hooks into as a heavy gamer, but also plays perfectly well the first time you yeah. sit down at it. And I think those are pretty mutually exclusive goals mm -hmm. in many cases. Right. No, I agree. And plus, once you get into like a super heavy game, people are willing to accept it, right? Like when you're getting into a Venhos or a 4.5 or something crazy like that. But Steel's not that, right? This is a medium weight Euro. This is not a heavy game. It's like a, a 2.8. It's a little bit above Race for the Galaxy. It's, it's not a heavy game and it plays in about an hour. But there's those great decision points and that system mastery reward that comes with a heavier game. And I think people aren't going to expect that. Now, the whole thing is I've now played this a number of times. And the thing is, I know this now, right? I've I played enough that I know that there is this potential problem of players not understanding the important value of the character. Deck. So now I'll front load that, right? So if I am teaching this game, I will spend additional time going through each of the mission cards. I will literally flip out every card in the deck, explain the distribution and what each of them mean to make sure it's clear. And then I will take out the citizen deck and I will show how the A's are different than the B's. Now I won't go through every card. And then I will point to the reference sheet and repeatedly mention during the game, before grabbing a mission, you might want to check the reference sheet and make sure the characters you want aren't gone already, or they're still to come. And the other thing is you don't use every character every game. So parts of the C deck never come out. So again, knowing that, knowing that not every character is going to be coming out, you don't want to hinge your whole strategy on one thing. So what I do is I front load it, which wow, has that greatly improved the initial gameplay experience. So when I taught this game to my sister-in-law and mother-in-law, they both, I, I don't know, but loved it. Like I think Brenda really loved it because she has to come back and play it again, which is a really good sign. And she came back and we played three player. Um, Collie, I think, dug it. Like she didn't complain about it, but they got it, right? Like they knew how to do it. The problem is I'm not everywhere. I can't be there to teach everyone who plays Bastille this the first time they play. But it sounds to me like perhaps the instructions don't perhaps focus on these details enough. Yeah. Uh, if it takes someone who's got a few plays under their belt to be able to teach it properly, to maximize game enjoyment and success, that says a little bit something about not necessarily the, the quality of the rules, but just the, the organization and the, and the level of importance placed on certain aspects in the rules. So again, if you look at it, they gave you a summary sheet with this information specifically. Nothing else. There's no summary sheet of the bonus tiles. There's no summary sheet of the, just the character deck and the mission deck on a one page sheet. So they obviously knew this was an issue or else right. they wouldn't have included that sheet. The problem is like who wants to deep dive a spreadsheet at the start of a game? And that's right. basically what it is, right? Like it's got pretty pictures, but it's a spreadsheet. Right. Now, overall, I got to say, I dig this game. Um, I admit my first play was rough. Uh, my first play with other people has been rough. My third play with new people was rough until I figured all this out, right? But I got to say, there is a very solid game here that's doing something interesting and new. That whole mashup of worker placement with auctions, like with, with bidding. I wouldn't call it auctions, it's bidding. It's an auction bidding mechanic. Plus, this game just is so beautifully produced. Like, just some unique things. And I got to admit, this is probably not good for colorblind people. I don't know. But the fact the players' colors are the French flag. You got red, white, and blue. And then they threw in black. And like, just that little touches like that are just, that puts it over the top out of most things in my thing. And it is just that design and the fact all the scorings right in the board just makes it a joy to play. If you dig auction games or worker placement games, I think you got to give this one a try, like find a way, like find, find a demo copies, try it at a con, see if your local game store will do a demo just to see it, just to see what they've done with these mechanics. If you are a fan of medium weight euros, like not heavy, but with enough thinking to them, like I think Catan fans might find a lot to like in here. I think you're going to dig this. But all I ask is do not give up after one play. Like this is, is I I've seen it. I have seen People go from eh to wow, that's actually really good. This one requires a bit of system mastery to shine. Now, one thing I see in reviews uh, of, from people on BGG is um, it's Lancaster's little sibling. Um, okay. Why why play this if you can play Lancaster? I own both. I preferred Bastille. It has been a long time since I played Lancaster. I couldn't tell you exactly why off the top of my head. But okay. Lancaster, going back to last week's topic, is something Deanna and I literally discussed this weekend about getting rid of because it felt dated. 
Right. That was the biggest thing with Lane Kai. It felt like an old Klaus Tuber came out in the year like before 2000 or around 2000. Right. It's just something about that game felt dated. And that's one where you're placing knights on spots to do something, and you can play higher knights to bump, which to me is different than multiple people bidding for a slot. Right. I don't know. Like, to be honest, I, I couldn't tell you exactly why, because it's been so long. Lancaster is literally, we haven't purged it. It's, it's <laughs> one of those we're going to try again. Right. And to be honest, now I'm curious. Now that that's come up, if we do play Lancaster again, I'm going to have to be comparing it in my head to Bastille. Right. I mean, they're both queen games. Uh, you know, they, Lancaster, yeah. Lancaster is notably higher on the BGG rankings, but it's also been out longer. So, uh, you know, it's got... Time. It's got the uh, and it's it's a slightly higher weight. It's a two point. It's a it's a three to Bastille's two seven. Two seven. I was close. It's so, two eight. Yeah, yeah, I was close with that. Which again, you know, with our yeah <laughs> mid, it, mid it's, range it's mid range match. heavy for us. Yeah. All right. Mid-range. Well, for a more in depth look at Bastille, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews, where you will see all the different areas and components.